Hi Duncan, uh, welcome to Boom Play. My name is Naftali. It's really nice to be having this chat with you. Now, I just I just want to know, you know, what have you been up to lately? What has Duncan been up to lately? Um, I've been I would say over the last uh, uh, eight months or so, um, I've been primarily working on um, this project in the sense of. I already had the project ready in February, but I've taken the last um, eight months to work in every aspect of Duncan in preparation of the album from, you know, my 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 image, um, you know, trying to update my image a little bit, you know, give something new, read a, a new life into my musical journey. Um, also be working behind the scenes, trying to, you know, make, deals here and there with, uh, you know, in the industry, just so that I'm able to um, set the right um, uh, medium so that the album can come out properly, like as though it was a big label, but I wanted to make it done very, very right. I, I know that you are in the U.S. In fact, you were U.S. born, right? Um, yes, sir. With Nigerian heritage, of course. So, um, you know, speaking of the album, uh, songs of Limitless Optimism solo, uh, and, you know, your, your desire to push the album and make sure that this is done right. Basically, every country in the world, there is the problem of the monkeypox. Now, how has the how has that affected, you know, trying to push your um, your album out? How has that affected, you know, the way you try to move your album? Um, interestingly that you bring that up. Um, funny enough, my last album that I put out in 2020, um, I released it like one week and then the next week everything was shut down due to covid wow. um so i couldn't do anything i couldn't promote plus there were so many unset uncertainties so i had to kind of buckle down a little bit on my finances because i didn't know what was going to happen you know and That's obviously you need the right amount of finances i would say with with this time around um i'm not letting anything slow me down <laughs> so right uh, Come what may, monkey pox, chicken pox, all the poxes, small pox. <laughs> we're still, we're still gonna do this. We're still out here, you know. So, um, I think there's after COVID, there's a there's a mentality that you know life has to go on. You got to do what you got to do. Um, so I'm actually in that mindset. I am focused, and I'm not letting anything distract me or slow me down in my. Exactly. in my agenda with this project now uh, let's talk about the album you know songs of limitless optimism that's a really uh, you know catchy title and c can you talk to us about you know the album in its entirety you know sure i mean it's it's even exci exciting to talk about because um this project is different from any other project that i've worked on um i basically funny enough recorded all 10 songs uh, in a space of less than a month. Um, wow. You were just working hard. Yeah, I just zoned in. And I think what also aided me to work on this project in that way is because I kind of removed a lot of the things that weigh me down in terms of overthinking, trying to, you know, like perfect the lyrics, trying to like overthink things, right? I just put myself in the zone. And one thing I did differently this time around was I basically turned, I had the instrumental uh, instrumentals that I, I looked around and scouted for other producers, younger producers. I do produce music. I do all of that. And I've mostly done my past album. I've mostly produced myself. Uh, whereas this time around, I, I looked to younger producers and started recruiting people into the project. And as soon as I got the, the sounds that were appealing to me, I basically turned on my microphone and just started, you know, Singing. recording without even thinking or writing. And basically that's how all the songs started coming around. And then after, after having what I have recorded, I now take it back 
and then I fine tune it and then I re-record it till it gets, you know, to where it needs. But the initial ideas came, you know, straight from just me allowing myself to be open. Um, before I would have instrumental and I'll, I'll take my, my, my uh, notepad and I will be ruminating, just write in for a week, just trying to get the exact thing. Uh, with this project, it was a little different. And I'm glad I tapped into something, you know, to get um, the, the records done the way it is. The title of, of the album, Songs of Limitless Optimism, you know, I wanted this album to very be very personal. At the same time, you know, I also wanted to bring inclusivity into it because the main motto of me, my music, is to have my music impact people, not just me, in a positive way. Um, so initially I had called it a uh, one-man show because okay. I'm the one, you know, there are no features on the album. I'm the one doing all the vocals, all the backing. Even yeah. I don't rap, but I rapped on this album. I don't do oh, dance, amazing. Though, but I did dance on this album. Like I did so many things like to show how versatile I am and but also to keep it within my grasp. Yes. Um so eventually I was like, well, one man show is not inclusive. It it kicks people out. So exactly. um I had to think very hard on how to keep what I'm trying to show about the project as just me doing the project but at the same time making something about bringing some kind of happiness to people so the the idea of solo and then when you actually it's solo right one yes but solo. then when you now talk say the the actual words songs of limitless optimism, optimism you're still having that message of trying to create up to optimism in the world, make people hopeful for better, make people have good feelings uh, with the music that are limitless. Um, so I think it, it stuck. And um, I know just the name alone of the album is also an utterance of fate. You know, it's like, I believe in how you, you know, like what you say, you know, has very, very huge um, effect on your life. And when you say limitless optimism, right, you're saying unlimited, it's unlimited your optimism is unlimited. So there's positive. no, yeah, there's no boundaries to how positive things are going to turn out. So that's what I'm hoping for this album. There's no boundaries to where this album can get to. So, right. so yeah, that's it. So when, when you look at the album and, you know, the entire journey towards creating the album, would you, would you describe Songs of Limited Optimism as an album that's supposed to deeply inspire people? Um, yes, one, th one, one thing that I, one, when I started making music, right, I started with writing like lyrics. And I think what drove my music the most was being able to write something that has a lot of meaning, a lot of story, a lot of, you know, deep stuff, you know, metaphors and a lot of that, because that was my headspace when I started making music. Right. Um, and then I, you know, melody was also my, a big thing for me. I was a melody guy. I always liked chords and progressions and things like that. I played the piano. So that's, you know, that was my thing. Um, with this album, I would say I tapped into the elements of today, of how Afrobeat is becoming, you know, like popular and cool sounding. Sound. Yes. But I also try to still retain some of those elements that are unique to me. That's I think true. that's what can maybe set this project apart, whereas it's not like every other project that's out there. So as much as it makes you feel good, the music makes you feel good, um, it, it, there's storytelling, you know, there's wordplay. Mm -hmm. There are things that make you uh, really, really see, or you know, when you listen to a song, you can envision what is happening yes, in that song yes. versus you're just, you know, Jaye, let's party. But if you <laughs> want to drive, you can drive to the music and think about it. If you want to mm -hmm. lay down or sleep or relax, you can be listening to music and you'll be thinking about what the person's saying. If you want to party too, there's, you know, yes, there's the ones, so Jaye. Exactly. So um, that's what the project, it, the, the album is all round. It's all in capacity, but at the same time, it ties into one body of work. So it doesn't feel scattered. It doesn't feel like you just 
put a whole bunch of tracks and just touched it together to make an album. Uh, when you listen to it, you see that there's so much cohesion cohesive. with each track. You know, it's so cohesive. Yes. yes. That's that's really amazing. Now I would I would love to get an insight as to some of your favorite uh songs off the album. You know, it's a 10 song yeah. album, 10 track album. And I, I'd like to think that there are a few songs that you can't get enough of. So you know, just, just yeah. tell us what are those songs. So I I I would first call out the songs that I'm that I think just generally everybody is just going to like or adapt to just mm -hmm. from a lot of feedback that I've done and, you know, um, research that I've done with the album because I've had the album played in, you know, research groups. And Never my daughter, it. too, who is a, a year and a half, it was oh. my first test test, test subject because, because <laughs> for kids, they, don't, they, they have no bias, right? Kids, if yes, they like something, true. they don't they fly, like they it. just say, yeah. So I played each song for her and you know the one that she's already you know as a child a little baby she's already bumping ahead to bumping to it. Like, okay this is that's the one, the one. so <laughs> so that's what helped me with that um so a ballon day is one song that i feel has um the elements of nostalgia in it that can make people listen to it without knowing why they're listening to it and <laughs> Um, it also brings a reminder to any Lagosian or anybody who has been to Lagos and has had to go from the mainland to the island. You always have yeah. to encounter a ballon day at some point. Exactly, so you have to. It brings, yeah, so it, it brings that reminder there. So, and the story is, it's a story, you know, you're listening to the words, what you're talking about, but at the same time, it's a very lovely melody, you know, and the, it grabs you. So, that's one of the songs, and that's the one that's already out, you know, the, the first single. Another song that I think when the album comes out will be very, very massive is a song called Diaspora Night. Um, hmm. It's, it's, um, I don't, it's, it's interesting because I don't think anybody has really done a song that is talking about the U.S. diaspora in terms of the music, right? So the yeah. song is focusing on a African party in the U.S. diaspora, especially, you know, here in the U.S. diaspora, there's so many um, African Afrobeats artists that don't really get seen or get recognized. Even when the big artists come here to do shows, you hardly you see any of these artists of even being put, you know, on the platform. Like, even the Nigerians here hardly know about the artists that are here that are doing Afrobeats that are Nigerian or African, you know. Yes. So I wanted a song that can really galvanize that movement bring some awareness to it. As a matter of fact, there actually is an association of U.S. diaspora Afrobeats artists called OSDA. I'm actually a member. So they're, they're a whole bunch. I think they're like 60 of us, you know, in that group right now and it's growing. You know, we're working together to bring more awareness to the music that we're making you're here. Closing the gap. Um, exactly. You know, trying to do it before somebody else does it for us, you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, Diaspora Night is a dope song. I'm sure guys will like it. But my... I would say my actual own favorite on oh, the yeah. album is a song called Madu. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny how that song came about um, is um, I had reached out to Burner Boy on DM about a specific issue um, in Nigeria, in Potakot, uh, with regards to the pollution and the suits yeah, and the all suit. that stuff. And, um, you know, Burn Boy is also, you know, from Potaka, he, ha he has a um, love for the city and it, it holds dear to him. So I, uh, I am too, you know, I started my music on Potaka as well. Um, and, you know, we really wanted to, we really talked about it. And, you know, he said he was going to, you know, he was going to definitely bring awareness. And I was like, you know what, I need to do something too. So I wrote a song um, called Madu and it really, you know, in a way, talks about communicates the um, issue. It, it communicates that issue, and we also shot a music video as well that wow. really goes delves deep and shows um, the issue to try to bring awareness. Uh, Burner Boy song "Whiskey" also, you know, does that too. To, um, yes. So I'm hoping, you know, when people get to watch the video too, that amplifies it as well. But to me, that's my favorite because I was able to really tap into my your experience vocal, my singing my mm. musicality but at the same time kept it very afrobeats but also 
had a message that is moving behind it, like an advocacy or a protest behind it. So I, I really have hopes that that song in particular gets a lot of um, traction when the uh, when the album comes out. It's my I, it's I my lo- favorite. I love. <laughs> I love to think. I love to think that um, all songs are definitely going to be heard and they are going to be positively received. And I think it's really good that you're using your platform, you know, as an artist. Now, um, I just want us to, you know, go back to the conversation um, with your daughter, you know, playing songs for her and trying to see the songs that she likes. Now, is this is this how you were able to select your single or ballet day? So that song she felt yes. the most. Oh yeah. So <clears throat> we play that song almost every day for her because if she's crying, if she's sad, and you play that song, she just like props up and she starts like okay. dancing and shaking <laughs> her head. So I was like, wow. And she does, I mean, she has reaction to almost all the songs on the album. As a matter of fact, I had even recorded more, more songs than what is on there, but I picked based on her reaction to fill yes. up the album. But the one that she reacted to the most was a Ballon Day. So I was like, okay, you know, it's it wasn't my favorite on the album per se, but yeah. this needs to be the first song that people hear because it's easily, you know, if, if a baby can listen know, to it and anything, enjoy it, can listen to it and feel this way and enjoy it, then it will tap into everybody's um you know, deep subliminal, you know, humanity that they have, you know, that childlike entity within everybody. Yes. If some people still have them, you know. Uh, so I, I I think that was a good thing because the song now is um, really, really doing well um, on pretty much all the platforms. Thank now, um, I want us to, you know, also talk about uh, Afrobeats in general and um, how far the genre is moving. So, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about, you know, an association of artists in the diaspora, you know, trying to close the gap now, which is a really good thing. So apart from the desire to uh, close that really um, wide gap, what other things would you love to see happen to the genre um, Afrobeats? What other things would you love to see happen? Um, I, w- I would definitely love, you know, to see... Um, the thing is, I mean, when things become mainstream, they get watered down a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's part of being mainstream. I yeah. think Afrobeat is now where it is mainstream. But the problem that I see hopefully gets addressed um, is ownership. Hmm. Um, in today's world now, a lot of our artists are signing certain types of deals with a lot of major companies who it's good to have those deals. You know, they provide the machine that gets the music yes, more it's... traction, yep. but you know, we still have to some worth, you know, cr- you know, create our ownership of it. So somebody else isn't telling us what Afrobeats is, yes. Yes. you know, when we know what Afrobeats is and then some dude, you know, at, the, the academy is, is writing an article and defining oh, Afrobeats, you know, ridiculous. in in a way that we don't even understand. Like, what what are you talking about? You know, um, at the same time, we need to um, also be measured in how we address it, so we don't come off, you know, a little, um, you know, like a little savage. You know, we, we <laughs> try to educate. You know, yes. um, but I feel like if we have more people. In this in this genre, in the room, in the in the boardrooms, in all these spaces where decisions are being made, the we situation. have we stand a chance to have more control and ownership of the discussion. Um, because everybody, I just was at Burning Boys concert on um, last Saturday, and mm-hmm. major majority of people in the crowd, this was in Chicago, yes, um, were not even African. You know, they just feel just like good music. And they just came to have a good time. You know, some people, if, you know, they listen to all these other mediums, they might not necessarily, you know, be tuned into the news in Nigeria, but they hear all these big outlets. So if these big outlets are defining Afrobeats in a certain way that's not the right way, then we stand to, you know, our birthrights, you know, become stolen. Exactly. 
So I applaud people like Obi Asika, people like Ayo Shonoya, that, you know, they've come up with all these documentaries that does give education insights, insights. especially to the younger, the younger generation. Genre because, you know, someone like me, I've been in, in the, in, I've seen the whole, you know, I've been there since 2003. I've seen the whole, you know, gradual growth of the genre. Even there was a time when in the U.S., people like myself, Banky W., you know, this is before Banky moved to Nigeria. We were making Afrobeats then. Well, we're trying to, you know, but it wasn't as popular. So a lot of people had to relocate down to Nigeria to try and, you know, make it. Some, some people went, but I stayed, you know, but now I'm able to see that, okay, now you don't necessarily have to go to Nigeria, you know, to really make it as an Afrobeat artist. Exactly. You can actually be in, in America because now Dude. the genre is being consumed here mainstream. So tap into what's here mainstream and make it big. So that's what OZDA is trying to do because a lot of our US-based artists in the past have been working all by themselves, like, you know, one corner, one corner, because America is big. So now yeah. we decide to form a committee, come a group, Something. come together and see how we can put all our resources together to be the voice. So even when Nigerian artists, uh, you know, Nigerian-based Afrobeats artists or UK-based Afrobeats artists come to America, they recognize that there's an actual body here, you know, that they need Who to must be listening to you. exactly to, you know, amplify it more. So I'm hoping that that's the change that can that can come because I know if that happens, there'll be more safe safeguards and there'll be more curation properly of the genre. I hope so too. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a really, really lovely conversation. But before we go, just very quickly, you know, so when you look at yourself and your journey, uh, where, where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, I see myself, first of all, still making music in the next five years. Course, How about that? Um, yes. But I also want to see that I've built my brand to um, a brand that is self-sustaining and that um, I don't have to do as much work in terms of the business because yes. I, as long, as much as I make the music and I, you know, do all the, you know, the songwriting and try to get the songs to you. I'm also very deeply involved in the marketing end and the promotional end, you know, all the other things that you have to do and multitask in today's world as an artist, especially when you're independent. Um, but I, I started, you know, I signed a publishing deal with Centric Music. I had a, I have a distribution slash marketing deal as well somewhere else. But I'm still carrying the business of the actual label and all that. In the next five years, I hope that I don't have to do that so I can spend more time with my family yes. and, you know, just make music. And then I have, it's already in the machine. I have people that are doing a whole lot of things. And, and that comes just like any business, right? Yes. When you start, when you're a startup, right? You know, you have to build your business to a certain level that investors and, um, you know, big sharks, you work, you watch Shark Tank, right? They yes. see what you've done and they feel like they can scale it, right? So that's where I'm building the brand Donkey Shark production too, to a point where some other larger investors or larger labels can be like, okay, now we can scale. So it's more of a partnership at that level versus, you know, them coming to, you know, take over your take over. your 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 entire thing. So that's where I hope to see and then branch out to like other media, other plat marketing and big bigger things. Because one of the things too I want to do is also set platforms for younger artists to know a lot of things before they get into the industry so they're well prepared for what to expect. Because there's so much talent out there in today's world, but yes. it's not the right um information for them. A lot of them get lost and a lot of those talents die, you know, and we need, we don't need that happening. <laughs> it's true. All right. Thank you so much for sitting with me to have this conversation. It's been really, really insightful. Once again, congratulations on the album and uh, my regards to your beautiful, beautiful daughter. Thank you so much. It was nice to talk to you, Natal Natalie.